Sometimes I don't know who's going to be there to hear it for sure. And uh, when I when I struggle putting a message together, whether it's uh, writer's block or whether you're, you're just having a hard time trying to put it all together, to frame it the way you feel inspired to do it. And this is one of those kinds today that I struggle throughout trying to pull it together. I had a very busy week. But I, the Lord just kept bringing me back some thoughts. So whoever's here today for this message, this may be something special for you. For all of us, but especially for someone, maybe. And uh, I know when I kind of go through the struggles putting together a framing a message, God must have something in mind because sometimes I, I'll start thinking, well, read somewhere else in the Bible, maybe I'll go a different direction. But then I keep coming back to where I originally was and I just lock myself in and just find God's word for today. Amen. And this was kind of what happened with this. The model and radical prayer. The Lord's prayer is called the model prayer. And I'm saying to you today it's a radical prayer. Thy kingdom come. In the New Testament, thy, the kingdom of God is mentioned 68 times in the New Testament. And the kingdom of heaven is mentioned 32 times. There's some difference, but some similarities as well. But let's ask the Lord to speak to us today concerning the model prayer, concerning His kingdom to come. Father, we speak we ask you to anoint the words today that you have given us, the words from your word that makes all the difference in everyone's life. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. God, we thank you for that word, that everlasting word of God that changes everything in our lives. Speak again, fresh and anew, to us this morning. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I love the Lord's Prayer. It's a wonderful prayer. Submitting to the ways of Jesus won't help you make friends. Can I say that again? Submitting our lives to the teachings and the ways of Christ is not going to win you friends necessarily. Or help you make friends with the world. Instead, when we submit ourselves to the teachings and ministry and the teachings of Christ, you're joining a revolution. Not a Tupperware party where you make friends. No, it's a revolution. And it's a revolution against the kingdoms of this world. Come on. The kingdom, thy kingdom come. This is where the Lord's prayer gets political. How many have ever said, somebody said to you, well, there shouldn't be anything political talked about in church. Well, I beg to differ a little bit about that. Amen. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Where the Lord gets, and the Lord's prayer gets very political. King Herod, threatened by his birth, sent out to kill him. Matthew 2. Also, the devil sought to tempt Jesus by offering him the kingdoms of this world if he would just bow down and worship him. Both Herod and Satan 
understood full well that Jesus was a threat. And I will tell you this, if you are a follower of Christ and you follow his teachings and your life represents what he wants you to be, you are a threat to people in this world. It's just a fact of life. Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to love you because just because you are a follower of Christ. On the contrary, the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is a radical prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wow. That's a pretty radical thing to say. The tendency today is to serve a domesticated Jesus. Do you like that term? A domesticated Jesus. One where we can tame his teachings down a little bit. We don't need to be too radical. We need to be winning people. Well, the tendency today is to serve a watered down Jesus. To tame his radical message. The teachings of Jesus in the Beatitudes hardly make the case that the kingdom ushers in an easy way of life. Not so. In fact, if you have people really liking you a lot and a lot of them, you might want to check your testimony. Because something may be wrong. Someone said, if you've been arrested for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? What a good question to ask. Yeah. Let's, let me go through the Beatitudes a little bit. Blessed are the poor in spirit because maybe they're conscious of their moral poverty. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom is now spiritual, but will yet be physical in the future. Blessed are they who mourn, who are grieving over their personal sinfulness. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That sounds good, doesn't it? Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. This all sounds good, doesn't it? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. How many would like some grace given to you? If you want grace, you've got to give grace. If you want a lot of grace, you've got to give a lot of grace. If you want a lot of God's favor, you've got to give a lot of favor yourself. Yes. Blessed are the pure in heart. Boy, my mama said this was one of the greatest promises in the Bible. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Wow. Wow. I believe that may be one of the greatest promises in the Bible. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are... Oh, it gets dicey now, excuse me. It starts getting a little dicey now. The other sounded good, and it was very good, but now it starts getting a little dicey. Blessed are those which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The self-righteous will always persecute the righteous. I said the self-righteous will always come after the righteous. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yes. Matthew is the only one that uses that term 32 times. The kingdom of heaven. That's another study in itself. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. 
But verse 11, blessed are you when men revile you. Ooh, it's getting more dicey now. And persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Ooh. But it, I like this verse 12. But rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. God's way and God's way of living will bring persecution. Yes. Let's go back to our notes. The petition in the prayer of Gethsemane in the garden your will, not mine. Not my will, but yours be done. Four words, your will, not mine, is the hardest prayer to pray in your life. There's not a harder prayer prayed in the Bible, in the 66 books, other than those four words, your will, not mine. Those are difficult prayers to pray. But it's a prayer of obedience not resignation. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven gives us true meaning to authentic Christianity and how to live it out. Are you listening to me? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven gives us true meaning to authentic Christianity and how to live it out. If you want to live the Christian life and live it to the fullest, it's always your will, not mine. It's always that. On earth, as it is in heaven, the phrase, on earth, as it is in heaven, we pray for the inbreaking of God's kingdom here and now, not just later. I said we pray in the Lord's prayer on earth as it is in heaven, we pray for this inbreaking of God's kingdom here and now, and not simply far off into the future. When we pray the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven, now, not just later, on the other side of eternity. As surely as Jesus has come and this world has already experienced the resurrection. We know that the coming kingdom is inevitable. Listen, I don't care what the Democrats do. I don't care what the Republicans do. I don't care what the Independents do. I don't care what anybody does. God's kingdom is inevitable and he's in power in a spiritual sense and the literal kingdom will come and nothing will stop it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is inevitable. Go mark it on your calendar. Chisel it in stone. It's going to happen. God's kingdom is above all. And nothing will change that. It doesn't matter what man does or what man tries to do. It will not stop the kingdom of God. But our prayer, but our prayer is that we experience, this is important, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray that we will experience more and more signs of this kingdom in this life. That we understand it more fully in this life and not just for the life to come. We, we need the world to see God's kingdom in us manifested now. They need to see it now. So I read this somewhere just a few days ago. If the living knew what the dead knew or knows, the whole world would follow Jesus Christ. If the living knew what the dead know now, the whole world would follow Jesus Christ. 
This is the, and this is the way to describe it. This is good, good verbiage here. This is the, we're talking about the kingdom of God. This is the already, but not yet. The kingdom of God is already, but not yet. Aspect of God's kingdom reign. By his death and resurrection and ascension, Jesus has broken the power of death and evil, and he reigns in power even though the battle is not over yet. But how many, how many took a peek at the back of the book? And you know who wins? Yes, the already but not yet aspect of God's kingdom reigns. I like what he says in Mark 1.14. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Not in your notes, but that's Mark 1.14. There is an alternating pattern, and that's the key word, there is an alternating pattern between actions on earth and actions and responses in heaven. There is a pattern clearly woven in the structure of Scripture. It's all through Scripture. This, this woven, alternating pattern of structure clearly seen in the book of Revelation, very much so, we, we see this pattern when something's going on on earth and something's going on in heaven. Something's going on on earth. When you read the book of Revelation, you see a couple of chapters. It deals with earth. Then it goes to heaven. Then it goes to another the chapters. It goes to earth. Then it goes to heaven. Then it goes to earth. The alternating pattern of what's going on on earth and what's going on in heaven. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot going on in the culture and a lot going on on earth. But I want to tell you, there's a lot going on in the heavenly too. Right now. At the same time, the alternating pattern of, of what's happening between actions on earth and what's happening in heaven. The pattern is clearly woven into the structure of Scripture and clearly seen in the book of Revelation. When we look at the darkest on earth, we see the brightness of heaven. When we see things happening on earth that really vex our spirit, then all of a sudden we, we read the Scriptures, we find out what's going on in heaven. Praise God for that. Amen? Amen? This isn't just a literary formula for understanding the Bible's most baffling book, the Revelation, but it's, but it's a scriptural way to decode and deal with the baffling events of our lives. Listen, when, when we see what's happening in our world, in our culture, that's why you got to stay in the Word and see what's happening in the heavens at the same time and what God is up to and what God is doing. The pattern of looking at earthly events, let me say it again, the pattern of looking at earthly events from a heavenly point of view makes good sense. Can I give it to you again? The pattern of looking at earthly events, and there's a lot of them happening right now, the pattern of looking at earthly events from a heavenly point of view makes good sense. The earthly, heavenly perspective can provide a framework for the totality of our thinking about life. Everything changes. I said everything changes when we view events here below with a perspective from above. You've got to look through those lens. Come on. We begin thinking like Christians. We begin to think like Christ. Seeing things as they appear from above changes our attitude about everything happening below in our lives. Come on. Isaiah 55, we quoted this the other night out there in our, in our cookout. 9 through 11. My ways are not your ways, saith the Lord, as high as the heavens is from the earth, as my ways from your ways. And then he said, verse 11, 
but my word shall not return void, but it will accomplish that which I purpose it. God's word helps us to think the way God thinks. God's word helps us to understand the way God works and the way God thinks both. Listen, everything changes when we view the events here below with the perspective from above. We begin thinking like Christ, like God thinks. He sees things different and then we see things. And we need to see them from a heavenly perspective, from the Word of God perspective as well. Both. Let's go to the back of our outline. The Bible says, our light and momentary troubles, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. That far, that far outweigh them all. Now I want you to make your little list of all the things that are troubling you and all the things that are aggravating you in life right now. And I have a list. The Bible says our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Come on. So, if I say so. So, if that's true, and it is, because the word God's word is true. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Come on, somebody say amen. We fix our eyes on things not seen, but things that are unseen. Come on. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Come on. You've got to do this exercise. You've got to do this or you can't make it. You've got to do it. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8.18, I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing to the glory that is being revealed to us. It's not even worth comparing when you think about it. James says a lot about it. We won't talk, but he says, there is wisdom that's from below and there's wisdom from above. Which one do you want to use? We achieve true wisdom only, if I say only, when we view the events of earth from the perspective of heaven, we must understand our daily affairs from God's vantage point. We must understand our daily affairs from God's vantage point. How does God see this? Have you, you know, the book was written, what would Jesus do? Well, I'm going to have to write another book. What does Jesus think? What does God think about this? How does God view this from his vantage point? Across all the experiences of life, God's word gives us heavenly commentary. I said God's word gives us heavenly commentary on our earthly days. And we look for wisdom that is from above. We can't deal adequately, I said we can't deal adequately with world events or personal challenges unless we see them from Christ's perspective who sits on the throne today. Come on. When we see things horizontally, we feel confused and sometimes overwhelmed. But when we see things vertically, Life makes sense, including the direction where history is going. Well, I'll tell you the truth. That is so true. You've got to stop looking horizontally. You've got to start looking vertically. When I see where we are as a nation, when I see where we are as a culture, I'm telling you right now, as much as I stand before you two and a half weeks ago, I felt God speak. I've told you this. I felt God speak to me a word in my spirit. I don't have it to happen very often in my lifetime. He always inspired. But I felt a word spoken in my spirit that things are much worse than what we even know. 
than what we can even comprehend. It's much worse in every front, in every direction. Much worse. But Luke 21, 28, when you see these things begin to come to pass, you don't look down and be depressed. You look up for your redemption is drawing closer and closer. Come on. Everything changes when we interpret events below with wisdom from above and see things as the Lord sees heaven and does things in heaven. Everything changes when we view through the lens of Scripture. Everything changes when you see things through the Scriptures, through the lens of the Scriptures. Come on. Every circumstance is manageable when we see it from the perspective of the eternal throne of our soon coming Christ. Everything is manageable when we see it from the perspective of the eternal throne of our soon coming Christ. In the half of Revelation 1, Revelation 1 says, sum up the book in one phrase and serves as the statement of purpose. And it goes like this, Revelation 1, 1, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Who are his servants? Are you one of his servants? What must soon take place? The information in the book of Revelation isn't for the world. Listen to me. The, 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 the information in the book of Revelation isn't for the world. My sister went to a college, Mercy University, a very well, prestigious college in Georgia, and her Christianity professor told her that the book of Revelation had no more value or meaning than the Sears Roma catalog. The information in the book of Revelation isn't for unbelievers and it isn't for the world which disregards it. It is for Christ's servants, followers, who value its message and long for the Lord's appearing. Come on. It's for those who know Jesus as their Savior and are eager for details about His return. Come on. Notice the word must. This verse says to show His servants what must take place. The events described in this book are pre-planned, preordained by the author of time and eternity and they will happen as exactly as announced. They must happen with no interruptions and nothing can delay or de derail them. They will take place as they have been preordained and predetermined. Can somebody say amen? God will fulfill his word. And don't forget, in that verse 1, even though it's been nearly 2,000 years since these words were written, the word soon is in that passage. And this word soon from the Greek can be translated quickly or can be translated suddenly, indicating that these events, once unleashed, will come with sudden force. Soon is a relative term. To the eternal God, to him in the heavens, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years from the heavens point of view. Okay? Now, he views the calendar from the perspective of eternity. Translation, it means that Jesus died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven only a couple of days ago. And the difference between the first coming and the second coming is only a few days. And Jesus Christ is going to come through the clouds of glory in only a few days. Only a few days from eternity's perspective. 
Listen, buddy, you get that in your soul and you won't be discouraged. You won't be overwhelmed if you get that in your soul and get that in your perspective. It was only a few days and Christ come. It was only a few days that he was born, that he lived, that he died, that he rose, that he ascended. It was only a few days. And then it'll only be a few days before he comes again. you got to see things from a heavenly perspective. And I finish with this. The quote, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until then, Joy, but until then, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until then, Jesus said, this is how you pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Hallelujah. This is what we pray until we see the Lord come. Let's stand together. Would you stand with me? Look at your notes, because you'll have the words. Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom For saving my soul, Joey. Let's try that one. Thank you, Lord. 
Say the Lord's Prayer on a regular basis and say it this way. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I thank you for these people here today. Father, we can't manage life on our own. We just can't manage it on our own very well. We have to see it through the lens of Scripture, through understanding the heavenly things, the heavenly wisdom for earthly things. Father, help us to take this message to heart. I know I almost didn't, almost didn't make it, putting it together, but somebody here needed to hear it today, and maybe it was me. I don't know. But God, bless it to whoever needed it today. God, help us to see and look through heaven's lens on earthly situations. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless our meal sharing today as we gather together to share a meal with God's people across the table with each other, sharing the joy of Jesus with each other today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy, for being with us today. And Father, we want to pray for Nancy Whalen, who's in the hospital, that we will be checking on shortly, that we didn't late last night. And Father, be with her protect her, preserve her life, and send the right people to help her that she can get the help she needs. We know that ultimately you're the healer of us all. No matter what we face, we thank you, Lord. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the Get your way down there. God love you. Bless you.